Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 54. The Screwtape Letters. Letter 27. Say a little prayer for you. Hello, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where Matt, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we're eavesdropping on the correspondence of a senior demon, Screwtape, as he explains how to tempt the patient, a human assigned to be tempted by Screwtape's nephew, Wormwood. Each week, we'll be considering a different letter, untwisting Screwtape's hellish logic, and forming a battle plan for our own spiritual lives. At the beginning of this season, we had the hosts of the podcast, What God Is Not, on this show, Father Michael and Sister Natalia, both guest co-hosting. And a couple of months ago, we had Sister Natalia back on the show to co-host, and so today, we have the Batman to her Robin, Father Michael O'Loughlin. Father Michael, welcome back to Pints with Jack. Thank you for having me. I love it. <laughs> well, you're also dressed in black all the time, so you are basically Batman. <laughs> That's true. I got to tell her to wear, well, what did Robin wear, green and yellow or something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know if she'd go for that, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. M- may- maybe the abbess also isn't quite such a fan. <laughs> well, it is true that, of course, we Byzantines, traditionally, you'd wear black if you're celibate and anything else if you're if you're not, for if you're a married <laughs> priest or a married deacon or something like that. But since we're both celibate, I guess we're both Batman. <laughs> Batman and Batgirl, maybe. <laughs> That works. <laughs> what have you been up to since you were last on the show? Ooh, well, uh, I don't think we were in COVID last time, were we? That's, of course, uh, been a thing. But I did get a, uh, I have a vicar now in my parish, which is wonderful, a second priest. And uh, he's a married priest from uh, Simi Valley here in California originally, but he serves out in Parma. He's on loan to our eparchy. Um, but Father Nathan Adams is his name. And uh, thank God we have two houses on the property because he's got a, a lovely wife and five daughters between the ages of, of three and 12. So it has completely changed the way that our, our, our property and the attitude around here. And I, I love every bit of it. We have scooters <laughs> and helmets and roller skates everywhere and Legos scattered all over the ground. It just feels like, like real life is happening. Um, and in addition to that, we also have a, a new outreach up in Camarillo, California. If you're ever up in Camarillo, Ventura County area, Saturday evenings, 5 p.m., we have a uh, an outreach up at the uh, Chapel of St. Mary Magdalene in Camarillo. Beautiful, beautiful church. We have a Byzantine Divine Liturgy on Saturday evenings. And I also, since we last talked, I have three new godchildren. So three that's three. just showing off. <laughs> I'm I'm up to uh I'm up to 13, I think, godchildren. So I love it. I love it, love it. <laughs> Now, for our non-Catholic listeners, you just spoke about having a vicar. Now, they'll normally associate that with the Anglican or Episcopalian church. Uh, what does you having a vicar mean? It just means an, an, a second priest, an assistant. So there's the pastor and then the vicar. Um, that That's an official canonical term. Um, we I think we would just say uh, assistant priest or something like that would be the more traditional way of saying it in the East. Um, it's usually someone who uh, who either has uh, very specialized gifts that allow him to to serve a specific parish and his specific needs, especially if the parish is bigger, um, or it or it's someone who uh, who for whatever reason is uh, the parish needs two priests, and so we're going to just say that's what the Holy Spirit did. <laughs> Our parish needs two priests because the pastor is not the best in the world. Um, <laughs> so God, God God sent me some help as as I need, and we've been doing great doing teamwork so far. Absolutely. Speaking of Eastern things, uh, when we're recording this, we are now rounding the final corner of Lent. Palm Sunday is in sight. So how's your great fast been going? Ooh, um, I've been quite humiliated, actually, uh, which is, I think, Excellent. The, one of the greatest ways to go about <laughs> the great fast. Um, although I this year I read, um, which I highly recommend, uh, Callistus Ware and Mother Mary's uh, the uh, Lent Triodian. The introduction it explains fasting in a, in a whole new way and and really emphasizes the need to actually be physically hungry and that's something i've never really worked on is spending most of the great fast actually being physically hungry because if we're physically hungry then our body matches our soul which is spiritually hungry for the resurrection and then so on the resurrection of course we eat very well we byzantines are very good at that um so if we if we actually feel hungry for the great fast are as just as our souls hunger there's a certain order in our bodies our minds our spirits so that when we do then later on are able to feast on pasca on easter and then our bodies feel full as do our souls in celebrating the feast of the resurrection of our lord beautiful stuff yeah i spend most of the great fast just whining that i want meat again and no. <laughs> I, I, 
I want to have yogurt for breakfast and I can't. <laughs> I know with me, it's cereal. I could eat, I could eat cold cereal, three meals a day. I love it. Grew up on it. And so even, even on Annunciation, which is this third, which is tomorrow, if you, if you celebrate the Annunciation and uh, I'm still not going to have cereal, I'm going to eat everything else that I want to eat, but I'm not going to do that because I'm <laughs> waiting for the glories of Easter just to have cold cereal. <laughs> uh, I just have this image of you for on Easter Sunday lunch, <laughs> just sitting down, you know, beautiful banquet table. Everyone's eating all this wonderful food and you're just there with your cereal, all happy as Larry. Me with my Fruit Loops and that, 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 that's, that's all I need. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> well, let's crack on with our standard segments. First of all, we've got the song of the week. And today's letter is all about prayer and time. And listener John Ma sent in a couple of suggestions. Time Passages by Al Stewart. Unanswered Prayers by Garth Brooks. And that one very nearly won out. But in the end, I went with the Queen of Soul, Miss Aretha Franklin, and Say a Little Prayer for You. Because not only is she talking about prayer, she's talking about petitionary prayer, which is something that Screwtape is going to be concentrating on in this letter. Next up, we've got the quote of the week. And the quote of the week is from today's letter. And it's where Screwtape writes, Use the heads I win, tails you lose argument. If the thing he prays for doesn't happen, then that is one more proof that petitionary prayers don't work. If it does happen, he will, of course, be able to see some of the physical causes which led up to it, and therefore, it would have just happened anyway. And thus, a granted prayer becomes just as good a proof as a denied one, that prayers are ineffective. Really looking forward to unpacking that. <laughs> Amen. But next up, we've got the drink of the week. And I'm drinking some uh, fast-friendly green tea. Uh, Father, are you drinking anything today? I am having uh, there was the sweet and spicy tea, I believe it's called from Good Earth, which is I, I, I have abused my taste buds in my youth eating hot green chili every single day. So most teas do not, I don't even taste them. Um, but so I need something really, really spicy like this or turmeric tonic or something. You'd even taste it. So I, I go for the real spicy ones. Something just to shock that you're nearly dead taste buds. Yeah, exactly. Uh, is that the kind of tea that's got a little proverb on the on the it label? It does. It does. Please, please share it. This one is, it is better to offer no excuse than a bad one by George Washington. Not bad. I like that one. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. And our final section is the chapter summary. So this is my 100 word summary of letter 27, which was first published in The Guardian on the 31st of October, 1941. Wormwood has been distracting the patient in prayer, but failed, as he knows he's distracted and praying about that. Screwtape says his petitioning prayers must be disrupted by raising intellectual difficulties and encouraging him to think of them as crude. Since he's unlikely to stop entirely, he must adopt the mindset whereby he disbelieves their efficacy regardless of the results. In reference to prayer, Screwtape explains that God is out of time, something taught in old books, but only scholars read these, and even they fail to benefit, because they never actually ask if what they are reading is true. Okay, let's let's jump into this letter. Screwtape, as always, he, he seems to love beginning his letters by just castigating his nephew for just being terrible, which I'm just going to make a suggestion. If you're ever writing to somebody and you want to gently guide them, don't just lead. Don't, don't lead with all of the abuse. But Screwtape says that his nephew has been making very little progress. Wormwood has been trying to use the patient's budding romance to distract him during prayer, but Screwtape says that he's just messed it up. He says, The whole question of distraction and his wandering mind has now become one of the chief subjects of his prayers. And Screwtape says that this is a chief sign that Wormwood has failed. Screwtape says that when distracting thoughts come across the patient's mind, Wormwood should encourage him to thrust those thoughts away by sheer willpower. Because he says that once he accepts the distraction as the present problem, and lays that before the enemy and makes it the main theme of his prayers, then, so far from doing good, you have done harm. Do you have any thoughts on this, Father? This seems awfully familiar to me, particularly when uh, I started going on retreats in my university years and was encountering silence for the first time. Yes. I think that the church in her wisdom has asked us to do many different forms of prayer, but the 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 main two may be the the structured prayer given to us by the church. And of course, as as Screw Tape refers to uh, later on, is the Our Father, 
you know, the, the, our father is Jesus tells us to pray in this way. And so the words of the, our father are the prayer to fall back on. And of course the church has given us Psalms, the monastic way of, of praying the Psalms multiple times a day of, of being aware of the saint of the day of the hour of the day of the feast or fasting season, whatever it may be. Um, but in addition to the, the gift of prayer that the church has given us, especially in the Psalms and of course the liturgy, the Holy mysteries, the sacraments, we also are, are asked to just be real with God. And, and to to take these prayers, if you ever read the read the fathers, you see that the fathers took the scriptures and then took them as the kind of the base foundation of their conversation with God, but then allowed their their personal, more subjective prayers, what was going on in their life to also uh, flow from these scriptures. So the scriptures and the liturgy taught them how to pray, taught them the words, but they didn't hide anything from God. And I think that's what one of the main points is here is don't hide anything from God. He knows what's going on in your mind. So why try to formalize your prayers to, to be something other than what you are? There's a certain inauthenticity when we do that. And so telling Jesus, Jesus, I'm bored in prayer, you know, <laughs> telling Jesus, I'm mad at you. You know, so these are some of the most authentic prayers. You know, if we, if we're mad at Jesus, we grit our teeth and just say how happy we are. Cause we think that's the right thing to say to him. You know, we're, we're lying and he knows, right? He can read <laughs> our minds, of course. So there's, there's definitely a, an authenticity to falling back on the structured prayer, the gift of prayer, when that is appropriate, when we feel ineloquent, but also to make sure that we are sharing exactly what is on our mind with our Lord as well. That I think becomes the petition prayer that, that screw tape and our Lord are both talking about here. The word that springs to mind for me is authenticity. When you're not being authentic in prayer, that's what screw tape wants. Yeah. Just do whatever you need to do. The stained glass masquerade, go through the motions and that's all I want. Whereas the thing he doesn't want is for us to be authentic because since we're authentic, we usually recognize a need within ourselves and we come to God humbly with that. And anything that makes people humble or puts them into contact with God, Screwtape hates. Yes. And there was a line in this section. I really wanted to make this the quote of the week because I think the line is fantastic, but it wasn't really the, the main subject of the letter. So it, it got bumped. But Screwtape says anything even a sin which has the total effect of moving him close up to the enemy makes against us in the long run. And I think you could take that principle and unpack so much stuff in it. I remember Scott Hahn saying that one of the things, one of the ways that God punishes us is to let us get what we want. <laughs> right. And that punishment is medicinal because it's very often when we get what we want and we see how far it falls short, how the, the, the promise of sin that we were sold failed to deliver even what it promised and that sends us back to god and the devil can empower and enable earthly success if he knows it's going to drive us further away from god so a lot of the even the petitionary prayer if if there's something that that we're asking for and the devil says kind of like job right you he, he's only doing well because he has these good things you know if we're only asking for what sinners ask for you know jesus says even sinners love love those who love them even sinners want nice cars and physical health and you know a nice house and and all these things um even sinners want these things so the the devil if he says that the devil knows us well enough by observing us and since our conception. Um, and, and he says, you know, in a sense, if, if I give him these earthly successes, it's going to drive him right into my arms and right away from Christ. And so the devil can actually empower giving us, quote, good things, you know, if he knows that we will abuse these good things or not be thankful for them, not, not praise God for them, and therefore move further away from God. Whereas, again, awareness of our weaknesses, even though our weaknesses are sin, awareness of those will, draw, will drive us closer to God. And of course, that's what he's getting at here is avoid making him aware of his weaknesses and then trying to do something about him by, by calling out to Christ to heal them and to make him stronger. It's like every major failure is a huge opportunity for grace and for us to turn back to God. But it does require that that choice when that failure comes. Do we double down on what we've been pursuing or do we realize the error of our ways and call out to God? Absolutely. Yep. That's where our Lord has so much more freedom, if you will, or so much more ability to 
form us when we are malleable, like the publican rather than the Pharisee. When we walk in the church, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, rather than walking in saying, "Thank God, I'm doing okay." You know, <laughs> you you can say, "Thank you, I'm doing okay." If that's on your mind, but you need to begin by saying, "Yes, I'm still a sinner. I I wouldn't be here if I wasn't need, in need of some kind of healing." Mm -hmm. And any good thing that I have comes from you, not yeah. because of my own making. Exactly. Now you mentioned petitionary prayer a moment ago, and that's the subject of the next section. Because Skrudev explains that due to the patient's budding romance, he has this new urgency in his prayer requests uh, for things that he's praying for. And Skrudev thinks that some promising work can be done here. So he tells his nephew to start raising intellectual difficulties regarding petitionary prayer. Now, Skrudev doesn't unpack what that is. So I was wondering, what do you think Skrudev has in mind? When it comes to petitionary prayers and and we're not being authentic i do think that we try to edit them according to what we think jesus wants to hear and and in a sense that's fine um we can do that because what jesus wants to hear is lord i want to be with you forever in heaven you know i i, I want i want to receive salvation from you but if we if we become purely intellectual and if we we jettison any of the deeper heart maybe you know separating that heart head from the heart the I forget who it was that said, you know, the longest pilgrimage in the world is one foot long from the head to the heart. You know, if if we if we focus only on the head and the head is is primarily concerned with what our five senses perceive, we forget that there's something transcendent, there's something beyond that. And it's more um like in Chesterton's orthodoxy, it's 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 more the the movement of the heart. It, it's a, his conversion was like a love story, you know, and you, you need both of those things. And if you separate the head from the heart or don't be moving towards the heart, then, then you're going to, you're going to get in trouble by rationalizing everything. When of course God is super rational and asking us to function in our, our relation with him in that way. So you were interpreting that more of that separation, the intellectual difficulties coming from intellectualizing what he's praying. I think at least jettisoning jettisoning more um, heart where God dwells part of it and remaining only in the head. That's how I interpreted that. Uh, see, the way I was thinking about this was things like, um, how can we have petitioning prayers? Does that mean that we're changing God's mind? Mm, okay. Or uh, an intellectual difficulty insofar as what do we do about unanswered prayer? How do we explain that? Because Jesus said, if you ask for anything in my name, you're going to get it. I asked for the Ferrari. The Ferrari mm. was not driven up to my house. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I could see that trying to explain to an atheist what prayer is, you know, that that's that's kind of what that is. How do you, you know, whenever there's a tragedy, uh, I, you know, you go on social media and people will mock Christians. Oh, well, do, do you just think they weren't praying hard enough? You know, because mm -hmm. this tragedy happened. Um, that's because people that are atheists only exist within the, you know, perception of the five senses. And so how so it's, it's purely intellectual. Um, rather than any sort of sense, eyes of faith, ears of faith, et cetera. So yeah, beautiful. And a strictly causal chain and really reducing God from the ground of being to my personal genie. Right, exactly. And that's what they think we Christians think God is and why we're attracted to Christianity, which is, of course, completely false. Although sometimes how we often talk about him. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and how we, we even think that way sometimes, you know, and that's why we can have moments of doubt in our faith because he's not fitting into the box that, that either we've created or we've been taught up to this point. So that was Skudek's first suggestion, raise some difficulties concerning these petitionary prayers. And he also encourages full spirituality. He thinks this will be another thing that will be able to derail these petitionary prayers. What do you think he means by this false spirituality? Because I, I get the impression that he wants the patient to look down on petitioning prayer as just being something rather crude, a bit basic, little, not particularly spiritual. Is, yeah. is that how you understood it? Yeah, I understood it as meaning follow the rules of prayer and don't don't go don't go out of the lines. Um, you know, prayer should look a certain way always, and it should look very pious and and being coming out of the lips of someone who is probably put together and is doing very well and and you know is is praising god and thanking god and and saying everything correctly well if you've done that you've never read the psalms you know because the the, the psalms are all over the place but but the that it's almost like a, a false piety that that tends to to in a fake way 
um, even exclude in a sense any part of our spirituality from our our brain only. You know, we we apostolic Christians definitely define faith as something that that is affected by and affects every single part of our being. So our body, soul, mind, spirit, we, all of these, our entire person makes acts of faith. That's why we can have, you know, days of obligation, solemn feast days, et cetera. We can have all these things. We can fast on certain days because we're using our entire time and space and our entire bodies and our entire spirits, everything is a response to God's gift. And that response is how we define faith, but the, the response that involves our entire person, not just part of ourselves. And if we think that, that, you know, if we, if we idolize what we think certain saints were in their, you know, they kind of, you know, walked with their hands folded in front of them the entire time and never thought a bad thought, you know, and <laughs> that that's kind of a, a, a false piety. The devil wants us to think that's the only way to be holy. Yeah, he definitely doesn't seem to want it to be very grounded and, for want of a better word, practical, as in yeah. as in every day. Uh, he makes a comment about uh, wanting the the patient to spiritualize the idea of praying for daily bread. Mm. You know, think think higher thoughts than just simply what I'm going to eat today. And he says, "Well, even this is actually don't let him don't let him realize this, but even that is a petitionary prayer, mm -hmm. no matter how much you try and spiritualize it." Uh, but the question that popped into my mind when I finished that section, and I want to pose it to you here. Does that mean that I'm allowed to pray to find a parking space? I would always say to that, yes. I think that 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 that's what he's getting at here is you can you can pray for a parking space, but I would encourage you if you're praying for a parking space, also pray for your football team to win, your baseball <laughs> team to win, because you begin to realize real quickly that that having that parking space may not be the best thing for the salvation of your soul. And, and so there, there needs to be a, the Lord, this is what I want, but obviously just what I want is not the only ball in play here. It's not the only thing that our Lord is considering is what I want. Um, this is why God is not a genie. He's not a vending machine. You know, it, it is, I, what I'm saying is this Lord, your will be done, but here is my will. Um, and so, I mean, what does Thessalonians say? Pray constantly. You know, why, why think I want to find a parking spot when you're just, you're just wasting energy? But if you say, Lord, I want a parking spot, it's all of a sudden become prayer. And any sort of prayer is is a, a deepening of the communion with God. And yet, if God asked us something like, you know, I, I could give you the parking spot or the little old lady coming up behind you in her car, you know, she <laughs> probably she needs pray? it more. Did she right? pray? I prayed first. I get it. <laughs> exactly. And that's one way of doing this, right? But the other one is to say is it's building up the entire body of Christ. And if I don't get the parking spot, then, you know, who knows? Or if it didn't open up because some old lady was right in front of me and she got it then or some pregnant mother or some mother pushing two kids in a, in a stroller, you know, whatever it may be that there's a certain humility that we need to have in our petitionary prayer that I may be wrong. You know, mm -hmm. I, I love, you know, just Lord, give me a parking spot or you are will be done. And that that's a great ending to any prayer or you are will be done. And I will trust that that your will is being done. But I do want to share because it's on my mind. You know, it's on my mind. So why not? allow myself to grow closer to you through turning just empty thoughts or or thoughts that could be wasted otherwise into prayer mm, into a dialogue yeah. uh, you you read the pages of the new testament and it's clear that god wants us to keep asking him for stuff yes. st paul talks about by in everything prayer and petition submit your requests humbly to god uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be answered the way that you would like yeah there's something about a father that just wants his kids to keep coming to him uh because they know that he's the source of everything that's good. Exactly. To tell tell me what's on your mind. You know, my my mother, as I've told before in other places, my mother used to have us sit for for ten minutes and tell tell her about our day at the when we came home from school. And it, I mean, what is she going to do with that? You know, she wanted it, but she was curious, and she just she was she loved us enough to ask us about our day, and she liked us sharing with her what was going on, and and she just treasured that because she loved us. And in some ways, turning our our thoughts into a dialogue with God are always good because they always bond us to him because he wants to hear them. And this conversation takes the form of undergoing theosis. You know, it's, we become more godlike and more united with him when we have this conversation with him. You know, we use our human energies to grow closer and to bind ourselves and to participate and to be disciples and followers, all these things. Prayer is just a simple conversation, just like it works with human beings. We go close to people through conversation, same thing with God. I was that awkward little boy 
who, when his mother would ask him, how was school, would give the very full answer of, fine. <laughs> what did you learn today? <laughs> Nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My mother would just not tolerate that. She, would, she, would, she had all those questions. Like, what was your favorite subject? What was your favorite moment? You know, all, all these things to kind of drag it out. So finally, we learned, well, we're not going to get out of this by just saying fine. So we might as well have something ready to go before we even see her. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. Well, Screwtape says that, unfortunately, because the patient has been a Christian for a while, he's developed habits of obedience. So he didn't hold out much hope that Wormwood is going to be able to get him to abandon these petitionary prayers entirely. And so Screwtape presents a strategy for getting him to disbelieve in their efficacy. And this was the quote of the week, where Screwtape says, OK, you wanted to get him to think, heads I win, tails you lose that if he prays and something doesn't happen, well, that's just proof that petitioning prayer doesn't work. If he prays and it does happen, he's going to be able to see something in the causal chain that brought about the thing that he was praying for. He's going to be able to trace that back, at least to some degree. And because he can do that, Wormwood has gone, then got to get him to think that, well, because I can see something of that chain, it was always going to happen anyway. So prayer still doesn't work. What are your thoughts on this? You know, it made me think of when I first read that the the stories I've heard of vocations of of people of men being near death and said, "Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll be a priest," or or you know, there's no atheist in the foxhole, you know, type thing where, Lord, if you save my life, I'll I'll go to church again. I commend people when they actually fall through on those things because I am so weak. I would get I would get out of the foxhole and I would say. That was just a foxhole thought, you know. I, I, I would, I would get out of the bind and say, well, you know, well, you know, I, I said I was going to be a priest, but you know, I was in a really weird place right then, you know. And it's there's, there's all these excuses we make. So I think that's always a temptation, and that's always be a temptation to, to see things in a way that actually don't call us on to change. Because right now I live in LA, and there, there's a lot of these kind of um, spiritualists and, and people that are followers of a certain spirituality that's, that has to do with meditation and, and breathing exercises and even astrology and things like this. And none of these, what I would call made up spiritualities, none of these are ever convicting. They, they don't, they don't require the changing of life. They don't require a real adapting. They're there to tap into when the person wants comfort or peace or joy, but they're not there all the time. And there, there's certainly nothing that is that is demanding a change in life and a becoming a better person for the sake of some greater good. Um, so, so we, it's it's uncomfortable to change. It's uncomfortable to grow. It's co conversion is uncomfortable. And so, whenever the uncomfort of the the easy and light yoke of Christ is presented to us, we we are going to find some excuse not to do it. We're we're children that way. You know, we'll we'll find an excuse not to do it. And so I think that's always a temptation, but as long as we know that's a temptation and know that we're probably going to think that way, then we can resist that temptation as it approaches, of course, with the grace of Christ. Your description there sounds very familiar insofar as it sounds very similar to how Lewis described the life force, which was uh, a worldview, philosophy, I suppose, uh, that was very popular at his time. And Lewis describes it in those terms. He says, well, the life force, this impersonal force today we would say the universe wanted me to have this it's it's wonderful to have that when you need it when you want to sense that there is something bigger than me that there is purpose to the universe but it's also not a thing that really interferes with my life it doesn't yeah. demand stuff from me yep yeah there's a great book called um everywhere pressed by father stephen freeman awesome and book it, it, i it love is. that book so much and it talks about the difference between a one-story world and a two-story. So oftentimes we think of the world as two stories. We're on the first story. God's on the second story. And we, he goes up and down. We go up and down sometimes. But we generally live in two different worlds, whereas the real reality is God is, like we say in the heavenly king, everywhere present and filling all things. Even, even the dead live in the same state. Would they, we have access to, to those who have gone before us, you know, the saints walk among us. He tells in that book, the great story about how the, you know, you'll be walking to a monastery and it's, it's not unusual for the monks to say they saw their founder who was, who died 500 years before just walking in the monastery among them. You know, this is a very common experience for them. So we, we, we live among God, you know, God is, God is with us. He, he's walking among us. So 
we it's not like we just tap into these realities every once in a while we 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 should have we have access all the time we are tabernacles of the holy spirit god dwells in our hearts and dwells among us and somehow sometimes we really want that and sometimes we don't when we're sinning we want god to be in a whole different story so it, this can be convicting and encouraging at different times during different experiences one of the things that i think is important in our understanding so we don't get suckered into this heads i win tails you lose argument is a very clear understanding that sometimes God will say no. I mean, there's basically three responses to a prayer. Yes, no, or not yet. Yeah. And I think a lot of the problems relating to what we call the efficacy, and even that is is a horrible way, really, of trying to think about it, because we're, again, we're reducing God to being a genie or a vending machine. But I think a lot of our problems relate to the efficacy of prayer. It's when we can't countenance the idea that God would deny us our request. Hmm. And some Christians, they've got their Jeremiah 29 poster up on the wall. You know, I, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plan to prosper you and not harm you. They, they take that verse, rip it out of context, and interpret it as meaning that God has got my back for everything that I want. Right. Not a particular message to a particular prophet, to a particular people at a particular time. And uh, Lewis, Lewis, he addressed this in a couple of other works. I went looking in preparation for this episode. And he wrote about it in an essay collection. It's called World's Last Night. And he actually has a piece called The Efficacy of Prayer. And in it, he says, prayer is request. The essence of request, as distinct from compulsion, is that it may or may not be granted. And if an infinitely wise being listens to the requests of a finite and foolish creature, of course, he will sometimes grant and sometimes refuse them. It's that simple. I love it. <laughs> well, we, we so often anthropomorphize God to such a degree that he's actually, he's even less than we are. Hmm. It's like, well, I've assessed that what I'm asking for is good, therefore I should have it. And, and I don't want to minimize it too much because sometimes you are looking at something, it's like, Lord, I was praying for something that was really good here. I, I cannot see a possible downside. So many people would have been blessed and you haven't. But in, in response to that, I then thought of A Grief Observed, which was, I actually first read it for the first time just a few months ago. And in that book, after Lewis has been pouring out his questions to God about the death of his wife, he says, when I lay these questions before God, I get no answer, but a rather special sort of no answer. It's not a locked door. Earlier in the book, he described it as a door being slammed in his face and bolted on the other side. He says, it's not a locked door. It is more like a silent, certainly not uncompassionate gaze as though he shook his head, not in refusal, but waving the question, like, peace child, you don't understand. This is an answer which isn't entirely satisfying, but I think it does take us some way forward in dealing with prayers that have seemingly gone unanswered, to be able to, in humility, be able to recognize God is God and I am not. And if there's a reason that this thing hasn't been granted to me, I have to trust that he knows what's best for me, even if I can't possibly understand it this side of eternity. Yeah, I think when you uh, you're you're going to be a, a father soon, right, David? And then this the the way the way you you raise your child and realize how oftentimes children do things or want to do things that will be harmful to them. And and how much they may beg and cry and plead and 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 you know um, being being a a greater being if you will in one in one sense that this is going to be harmful to you and I I uh, I imagine that that's a, a beautiful moment for parents uh, to to say okay I'm a, I'm a I'm a beautiful child of God and and I have to trust that God knows more and yeah, I might throw a fit and a temper tantrum but in the end you know I will I will know or not know maybe it's not mine to know. And why God does the things he does. Mm. Pushing on, Screwtape says that Wormwood won't understand how the patient could be this gullible to fall for this heads I win, tails you lose scenario. You and I have just spent a little bit of time trying to unpack it and uh, search out answers. And Screwtape and Wormwood, it's like, uh, how could they be this dumb? How could they be so stupid as to interpret both success and failure as proof that prayers don't work? And Screwtape takes a little bit of time to unpack this. He, he attributes it largely to the fact that humans live in time and that we think God does as well. And he, he really dives into this question of predestination and free will, which is 
needless to say, a huge can of worms trying to reconcile the two. Because there, there are a few different ways that you can try and solve that problem or at least deal with it. Uh, Armenianism, Calvinism, and probably open theism as well. And once again, Lewis sort of just boils everything down and just gives you the point that you really need to chew over. He wrote this in a letter that's dated the 3rd of August, 1953. I think we must take a leaf out of the scientist's book. They are quite familiar with the fact that, for example, light has to be regarded both as a wave and as a stream of particles. No one can make these two views consistent. Of course, reality must be self-consistent, but still, if ever, we can see the consistency, it is better to hold two inconsistent views than to ignore one side of the evidence. The real interrelation between God's omnipotence and man's freedom is something we can't find out. So he's saying, rather than just ignoring part of the evidence... You know, scripture is very clear that uh, God foreordains, but it's also clear that we get to choose what we want to do. And he's saying that rather than just ignoring one side of that evidence, we just have to hold those two things in tension. But he says that God being out of time helps solve this to some degree, because that God can include our praise today as one of the innumerable factors in guiding events of the future. But Screwtape says that if the patient was told this, it wouldn't do him much good. He says that he would reply that then the enemy always knew men were going to make those prayers, and if so, they did not pray freely, but were predestined to do so. And he would add that the weather on a given day can be traced back through its causes to the original creation of matter itself, so that the whole thing, both the human and the material side, is given from the word go. So the patient is arguing that Ultimately, God is in charge of everything, so it's all set out and predestined and nothing can be changed. And Screwdate points out that this is all just because the patient projects his own way of perceiving reality onto God. The enemy does not foresee the humans making their free contributions in a future, but sees them doing it in his unbounded now. And obviously, to watch a man doing something is not to make him do it. And listeners will remember when Lewis spoke about this in Mere Christianity, when we looked at that in season one, he talks about picturing time as a straight line along a page where we travel from one point to the next to the next, whereas God sees the, the, the whole page in its entirety at once. Okay, my brain's kind of dead. <laughs> I've tried to reconcile predestination and free will. Father, what is your wisdom? I, I think uh, there's that there's that great joke about uh, this parish and in our byzantine parishes we do prostrations during the great fast there's a great joke about people arguing over which form of prostration to do in this parish some lay flat on the ground the other ones bend their knees and only touch their foreheads to the ground they go to their pastor and they're fighting they go to the pastor and they say well, father which one do we do and he says i don't know i i don't i've seen them both you know go to the bishops they go to the bishop bishop which one do we do the people are fighting they're killing each other over this and bishop's like i don't know i don't i've seen them both you know go to this monastery they go to the monastery hagiman says i don't know there's a hermit high up on the mountain go to him they go to the hermit and says you know holy father the the the, the some of us are doing prostrations this way so we're doing this way we're fighting tooth and nail we're getting all upset with each other what is the tradition father and he goes fighting and getting upset that is the tradition <laughs> <laughs> So in, in other words, there's there, there's something about the, this tension, as, as you said, David, there, there's a tension here um, that I think just needs to remain tension that there's a we're not we're not going to fully understand or fully be able to explain it because it, it is the things of God. It is it is not this unbounded now is is beyond our created ability to perceive it now one day we might one day we, we might not but it's it's that's of god and time and space are of us and so we analyze time and space and yet we humbly stand before god and say you have somehow revealed god that your reality is beyond ours your reality is above ours eternity is something that i cannot wrap my mind around so i think the proper response is not that the anxiety is the tradition but rather the humility is the tradition. So we need to understand as, as much as we can 
um, that that God perceives things differently than us, and he perceives everything at one moment. We can perceive one moment, and we can kind of therefore try to intellectually understand what it means that all of our moments for our 80, however many years of life, are all compacted in God and into one reality outside of space and time. And hopefully that's beautiful to us, but I, I think that there's the the answer to that is is in humility, we we don't know. And, and yet we, we, we try to perceive it as best we can after learning that of God. And then we take a step back and say, Lord, I, I trust you to, to sort this all out on your end. I think a little bit of apophatic theology can come to our rescue here <laughs> to know exactly. what God is not. God is not just like me. Exactly. He is utterly unlike me in ways that I can't even understand. Yeah, the key word that I think there is humility, to realize that this is something way beyond us. It doesn't mean that we don't try and wrestle with it. It doesn't mean that we don't try and understand and press out for the answers that we, that we think we can, that we can gain and a, get a slightly deeper understanding of the things of God. But in the words of my former pastor, there comes a point when we just make a solemn bow, either kind of prostration is fine, make a solemn bow and, in, and, and wave some incense around because <laughs> we've, we've gone beyond our intellect. Yes, and that, and that should be, for, for the Byzantine apophatic mind, we think that is beautiful. You know, it, it's exciting to have having experienced a mystery beyond our intellect. It, if, if we could wrap our mind completely around it, it would be boring to us. So the fact that we can't is, is an exciting adventure that we will be able to continue to be on for the rest of our life. And if somebody's thinking that, no, we should really be able to work this out, here's my challenge to you. Go and watch the Christopher Nolan movie, Interstellar, and then try and explain it to me. Because, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie, I'm going to explain how it ends. He somehow gets sent back in time, or at least into a, into a place where all time is present, so he can communicate with his daughter from years before, so she can... Uh, it, it's a very confusing movie, but <laughs> you know, you get a headache just trying to think about and explain that movie, and that's that's on a even that's on a far smaller scale than what we're talking about here. Absolutely, and and I, he probably got that idea from from our you know theologians' attempts to understand the transcendent that that is beyond us, and how they portray that in art, and in a sense makes it a sacrament, putting it in a movie, but it still does not explain everything as, and it never will. Well, maybe he got it from Boethius because that's who Screwtape alludes to next, uh, who was a 5th or 6th century Roman philosopher. He was also a statesman. And he, he wrote a work called The Constellation of Philosophy. He wrote it in 524 uh, when he was imprisoned by the Ostrogothic king Theodoric the Great. And in Lewis's book, The Discarded Image, he says this is one of the most influential books ever written in Latin. And there's a lot of works written in Latin. So that's saying something. And uh, even when Lewis was asked to list his top 10 books that had shaped his philosophy of life, this was one, one of the ones he mentioned. And in that work, Boethius explores this question of free will and predestination. And he, he argues from the point of view of God being out of time. I'm going to admit, I haven't actually read The Constellation of Philosophy, although I have looked at it in bookstores on occasions. <laughs> uh, have you read it, Father? I read it a long time ago. I got my bachelor's in philosophy, so I I, I read it as one of the one of the foundational texts. Obviously, late um, according to philosophy, because most of it's it's um, you know ancient Greek. It was my was my focus, but I do remember two things that were beautiful. I, I studied at a Franciscan school, and I always found that Boethius's conversation with philosophy um, was very similar to uh, Saint Francis of Assisi's falling in love with Lady Poverty. It, it adds a a d dimension of the heart when you're having a discussion, especially since um, in Boethius, philosophy is a feminine character. It's, it's this wisdom, if you will, from the Old Testament. Um, so this conversation adds a level of engagement and 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 a, a personification that I that I it was was my type of. It's almost like Plato, you know, with the with the dialogues. It, it adds something. There's a story. There's a community happening there. Um, but also the fact that, you know, he, he wrote this from prison, you know, he, he wrote this as a, a trying to um, engage and to uh, put words to something himself about when, when fortune doesn't smile on you, when, when the world fails you, you know, this, we just celebrated St. John Climacus, right? The very first step in the ladder of divine descent written by St. John Climacus, the very first ladder is the renunciation of the world. In other words, the things of the world will not satisfy. This is very Augustine, you know, the things of the world will not satisfy. And so for Boethius, he had to kind of, all of this aristocratic life had to fall apart 
you know, and his father was, was, was killed. And then, then, then he, you know, was in prison later on and he, he had to, he wrote about how much deeper he understood his love of knowledge and his love of beauty and his love of, of wisdom from the point of view of having everything else taken away. And, and, and what, what a freedom and happiness there is when you can cling to virtue rather than just the things of this world. So th those are the things I remember about it. And, and, and what a, what a beautiful experience he must have had in that, in that year in prison to, to find these, the beauty and the deeper things that cannot be taken away, just like his freedom was. So it sounds like you were consoled. Oh, yes. Yeah, exactly. The consolation of philosophy. <laughs> and, and that's, he, he found consolation and I, I found consolation too. And hopefully I'll, if I ever am in a situation where fortune stops smiling on me, I will find consolation in God and therefore also in philosophy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It makes me think of the book of Job. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Mm -hmm. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Now, after mentioning Boethius, Scutate mentions he isn't worried about guys like Boethius receiving his consolation in philosophy. But he's not too worried about Father Michael having his consolation because he says, by and large, only the learned read old books. And he says, we have now so dealt with the learned that they are of all men the least likely to acquire wisdom by doing so. And he says that they've done this through the what he calls the historical point of view, which is a little different from the historical Jesus we dealt with a, a few weeks ago. Screwtape says, The historical point of view, put briefly, means that when the learned man is presented with any statement in an ancient author, the one question he never asks is whether it is true. He asks who influenced the ancient writer and how the statement is consistent with what he said in other books and what phase in the writer's development. And he goes on and on. He's basically saying that when scholars read these old books, they just do literary criticism. He says that to regard the ancient writer as a possible source of knowledge, this would be rejected as an utterly simple-minded idea. He says it is most important thus to cut every generation off from all the others. And all this culminates with him saying that thanks to our father below and the historical point of view, the idea that you just read old books for literary criticism, not actually trying to find truth or wisdom, he says, great scholars are now as little nourished by the past as the most ignorant mechanic who holds that history is bunk. And that last sentence is really sarcastic when you realize what Lewis is referring to. This ignorant mechanic is Henry Ford, mm. the 19th, 20th century producer of motor cars. Uh, he was interviewed on the Chicago Tribute and he said, history is more or less bunk. We don't want tradition. We want to live in the present. And the only history that's worth a tinker's damn is the history we made today. Which sounds very self-empowering, very wonderful. But if you think about it, it's really stupid. It is. And I think that that arrogance is what caused Henry Ford to almost single-handedly destroy the idea of art and destroy the idea of, of creation and artistic creation um, because of the way that he just had every worker, like a worker bee, you know, doing one part of making the car. No one knew how to make an entire car. They all know how to make a muffler or a steering wheel or a wheel. It destroyed the the creative and even the sense of the ownership of not not that I don't like cars. I do like cars, but you know, that there, there is something I think Henry Ford was was rejecting a lot of what made humans human. And and thank God for people like Lewis to, to point these things out. And once you get as rich and powerful as Henry Ford, I think you, you, you think you have more wisdom than everybody else. Unfortunately, many people will do this. I do want to say though, that I think, um, at, but right before he criticizes Henry Ford, he has a great cell phone in the, uh, in the talking about the learned or the ones who read old books. He obviously reads old books and in, 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 uh, in screw tapes criticism of them. He, I think he's also reflecting upon himself as, and almost making fun of himself as, as being one of the few in the proud that read old books. Um, but of course, in the end, this is something that he sees as extremely beneficial. I also want to point out that line from Chesterton in Orthodoxy, um, where he says that tradition is the democracy of the dead. I, I, I love that line. Th those who have gone before us are still able to have a say in our current society. And so it's not just those who are living who get to vote on what is best for us, but even those who have gone before us. And we, we tap into their wisdom as well. And it's foolish when we just disregard it because they're not here anymore or yeah. an idea because it's old. Lewis called this chronological snobbery. And we see it all the time with 
ideas, morality, and even Christianity. There's always the temptation to, let's just start afresh. Let, let's, let's just reconsider everything from first principles, and we will reconstruct things as we see fit, as we see things. And to not think that maybe those who have preceded us, maybe they've tested out some of some of our ideas in advance and concluded that, no, this doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, and that actually maybe they have some wisdom to pass on to us that would be much better if we received it. This is the wisdom of God in, in empowering and creating the Holy Scriptures. Because if we didn't have something written down that was 2,000 years old, God only knows where we would go you know it would be like the uh, the grand inquisitor in the brothers karamazov you know uh, jesus you left you're gone now now let us run with this and don't come back and, and spoil what we're doing in the church um you know keep your promises and, and, and remain in heaven away from us there you know there's there's something that that our our own arrogance out of selfishness can get in the way and saying we're we can obviously do it better than all those who came before us so let's forget about them because they're just a stumbling block to what we want to do which is very very dangerous and you've mentioned G.K. Chesterton a couple of times. And since my wife runs Pints with Chesterton, I have to come up with some quotation. <laughs> uh, uh, this is Chesterton's fence. This is where he says that if you encounter a fence, the first thing you do is not just get rid of it. You've got to work out why it's there. Yeah. And then you can get rid of it if necessary. I work in software. So my tendency when I come across somebody else's code is always to, oh, this is terrible. I'm just going to I'm going to rewrite all of this. And I don't realize the other constraints, the other things that they were that they're having to deal with and handling that I don't realize yet. And very often when I start recoding an area that I think needs needs work and I'll do it far better, obviously, I start coming across problems. It's like, oh, I need to handle it in this situation. Oh, I'll have to add this check. Oh, that was why they had that check there that I thought was useless and pointless. We find this all the time. We always want to do things from scratch ourselves and it'll be far better. And while it's good to have uh, an eye to looking at can something be improved, it's the height of hubris to think that we will know what's best all the time. We can guard ourselves from having egg on our face if we at least always ask the why question first. Why is it like this? Is there some value to this? Before we start, in this case, ripping a fence out, rewriting a software module, or whatever else it is that we're doing. They tell every pastor the conventional wisdom is to change nothing for a year. Yeah. You know, when you go to a new parish, just listen to the people, keep things the way they are, because there's probably a reason why those things, and then if the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart to change things, to help the parish grow to the next level, if you will, then you start changing things. But appreciate what's come before you for a full year before you try to bring in your own personality and change anything according to what you discern. Oh, yeah. I was at a parish once. Its name will remain nameless. <laughs> but the pastor came in and started changing a lot of stuff, and he alienated everybody. Yep. Yep. <laughs> And and it's you're right. It's, it's the height of arrogance to to think that a parish should be in your image and likeness or according to your personality, and not realize that uh, there's been years and years and usually decades have gone into this formation of this parish at this point. And if you, it's it's a real wrenching for the people to try to change up where they find God to try to change up God's house and the, the aspect that they they've learned. That you can do a lot of damage to souls that way. It's it's something that we we need to remember as pastors. Absolutely. And it doesn't mean that you never do it. It just means that you listen, you ask questions, and you do things cautiously. <laughs> exactly. God put you there for a reason, most likely. You know, and and um, our Lord needs you in that parish. I'm preaching to myself here, as you, as you can probably tell, right? God, <laughs> God, God put you there for a reason, and He wants your personality, your temperament, your thoughts, your prayer, and He wants those there. But that's be good for those people. But you need to make that transition with wisdom rather than with any sort of arrogance. And with that, let's go on to unscrewing screw tape, where we take all of Screwtape's negativity and twisted logic and try and straighten it out a little bit and offer some positive recommendations for people to follow in an effort to undo Screwtape's plans. So my first one was, do not try to push away distractions by force during prayer. This is what Screwtape wants. Uh, but instead, do bring everything to prayer, even your distractions. Did you have any further? I would say, do not hide anything from God. Do not try to hide anything from God, I would say. In other words, let, let your stream of consciousness become a prayer. And don't be ashamed of these things, even if you need to apologize to him later on. But, but do, do not, I guess that's just say, do not think 
you can hide anything from God and do not think that, that there's anything that, that is going on in your mind that will, will, God will not, you know, cancel you <laughs> because of thoughts or prayers that you have, you know, there's nothing you can do to, to completely cancel yourself. And I would say, do, um, get excited about unanswered prayer. I, th I think that there's, again, there's something, if God just, an if he was a vending machine and, he, and we, we inserted good behavior or inserted money or inserted prayer and got out exactly what we wanted, that'd be a very boring God to go back to Chesterton again, right? That'd be a God that was me. I'm God. I decide what's best and what's not. Um, whenever there is unanswered prayer, I know this is this is a hard thing to think of for the the deeper things that can be very hurtful to us, but um, there should be a level of excitement and adventure in saying God has other plans other than what mine are. God has bigger things in store. Um, God has more grace-filled ways of dealing with me and others. And if we truly trust God, then unanswered prayers can be a moment of, of, of great joy, excitement, expectation, and even hope. That's really positive. I don't do that in the slightest. <laughs> I don't either, but I'm, I'm again, I'm preaching to myself. I, I do think that's the ideal though. I like it. No, I, I do. I do like that. When, when God, when God says no, you think awesome. He's got something better. In mind. Right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. A couple more from me. Do not give up on petitionary prayer. Do not think of God in human terms or put another way. Do remember what God is not. God. Amen. Uh, and do read old books. And do not ignore the question of truth as you read. I would say uh, do do read more Lewis and Chesterton and and all the fathers. Do do read those wise men who have come before us. Listen to them, trust them, and uh, and do not reject what is what has come before us in this wisdom outright in favor of of newfangled or or self satisfying thoughts that we have that that came from nowhere and we do not know. Uh, whether that was us or God or the devil, be very careful with those things. Sage advice. Father Michael, thank you for coming on the show. Very welcome. I love this. Thank you, David. You're, you're doing good work here. Thank you. And we want to thank all of our top tier supporters, Gary, Jake, Stephen, Matt, Jeff, Chris, John, James, Kate, and Rowdy. Please share a link on social media of your favorite episode. Introduce the show to your friends. And join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>